If you're staying in here with us, you're, uh, you can take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. They go together, um, I think, better than apart. Uh, that's not just my opinion. Uh, it's others as well, but uh, that'll be there for you. The, the text will not be on the screen, uh, but the texts that are not in Psalm 42 or 3 will be on the screen. So I encourage you to open your Bibles and turn there so you can follow along together and encourage you to, um, if, you, if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew right in front of you. And if you don't know where Psalms is, just take your thumbs, stick it right in the middle and just pull it apart. And I'll bet you you're in Psalms. And then just find the big number that says 42 and you'll be right there with us. That's my best, uh, that's my best guess. Uh, church, if I stood up here this morning and I said the struggle is real, would I get an amen? Yeah, the struggle's real, isn't it? Uh, as a kid, uh, as a high school student, we had a, a place <coughs> called uh, Lake Ivanhoe. And uh, on Lake Ivanhoe was a place called Jump Tree. And Jump Tree existed because there was a big rope on Jump Tree. And you could climb up to that tree and you could grab that rope and then you could fling yourself out over the water and let go and fall in the water. It's like a big, you know, Mountain Dew commercial or something, something crazy, right? Just a bunch of kids, woo, and just let it go. And you're, you know, you're up there probably two or three, you know, 20, 20 feet in the air and you just let it go and you just feel yourself dropping the water. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, my friends, not I, not I, but my friends uh, decided one night they were driving around, they were bored, nothing, nothing to do. So they decided they would go and do jump tree at night. So they, Pulled up in this neighborhood because it was a it's a nice you know it's a decent neighborhood and they pull up and they uh, get down to their boxers because they didn't plan it so they didn't have their bathing trunks they got in their boxers and they come up jump tree and they do it a few times my suspicion is they were loud and they were noisy and such like that and wouldn't you know it uh, somebody who cares somebody who very much cares about the youth of that day uh, called their local police officers and said hey some kids are jumping from jump tree it's a bad idea and so the the sirens went off and. The light showed up, and my and my friends, my friends, uh, they got out of the lake only to stand there shivering cold in their boxers late at night while the police came out. And uh, as if that's not enough, it just so happened by the Lord's good providence that that officer that particular evening was a woman. And uh, so my friends stood there uh, in trouble with the law uh, because they decided to jump on it. Like like as a youth, right at that moment, like the struggle is real, right, church? Amen, amen. The struggle is real at that point, right? Uh, I, I believe uh, they were shown some kindness, let off, and told not to come back ever again, which I'm pretty sure that probably took place, at least as far as the police know, and uh, everything was fine. The, the struggle's real, right? You mess up, that kind of stuff. But we're adults now, and uh, and there's when we say the struggle, right, there's something more than just, you know, mishaps on, a, on, a, on any given weekend evening, right? There's, there's real struggles, and we need real answers for real struggles. Um, I, I recently... Um, got an email from a, a congregant, and, and it read something like this. It said, I, I keep pondering on the verse from yesterday, yesterday uh, after one of our sermons. It, it writes, where, where the verse says, He, the Lord, put a new song in my mouth. And they went on to write, I've been thinking about it in relation to my circumstances of grief and mourning. The joy and song that God has given me is different than before my personal tragedies. But there is a song, and it is new, and it's different. I am different since then. And, is God, and God has given me a different and new and wonderful song. The struggle's real, church. And we need answers for our real struggles. Uh, even beyond, and we, we use the word struggle, and it's like this big, broad definition, right? But, but yesterday, I, was, I had the privilege of being in the ocean yesterday and swimming around, and I noticed these, these older men were swimming from buoy to buoy, and they were, they were beasts. They were just pounding the ocean, just going back and forth, and I was like, holy goodness, like, what's, like, is this a race? Is this like a competition? Like, what's going on in this uh, this? Uh, older lady was swimming casually by, and I was like, hey, miss, can you teach me something? Because, you know, I'm very bashful and shy about meeting new people. And and uh, she was like, yeah, she, she had that New Englander look like, why are you talking to me? That, that kind of impression, right? But I didn't care. I just pushed through church just because I'm full of love. And um, <clears throat> and I said, I said, what's this? She's like, well, they're just swimming. And I was like, yeah, but they're swimming, you know, back up. She's like, she's like, what's the big deal, you know? And so she began to explain to me that the people just swim back and forth and they're just being in shape and they're like, oh, and, and she's like, well, I do it, you know, going down with the current and such. She goes, but yeah, these guys, these guys are beasts. These guys are monsters. They just, they're just clobbering. I was like, yeah. So we just keep talking. We just keep talking. And all of a sudden, like, 
it, you know, it comes to, somehow, the conversation comes around by the grace of God, Holy Spirit, like, I'm a pastor, and I'm going back to church tomorrow to preach. Like, she's like, oh, she's like, she goes, and this is what she said. She said, oh, I'm, she was like, this is her words. She said, she said, oh, I, I go to the Catholic church. She goes, she goes, man, I hope, I hope one day, I, I think, I, I hope one day I make it. I hope I, hope I get there. I hope, you know, I'll be in, in you know, in heaven. I've done, I've done, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. Like, I've been doing some good things and such. Just standing there, just, you know, in the ocean, just, you know, sort of waist deep, just talking. And I just, I just looked at her, you know, I, did, I, I, you know, I wanted to start into my sermon this morning right then. I just like, hey, let me help you out, you know. But I, and I said, I said, well, I said, I said, listen, I said, I'm pretty sure we spend a lot of time trying to compare who we are to other people. I said, but if you, if you just read the Bible, it tells us that you, you, you only, the only comparison to be made to is to Jesus, and he's perfect. And you can't get it done. Like, you know, you, I'm always failing. I always fall short. I was like, so, I was like, I just want to encourage you. I was, I was like, I was like don't, don't trust in your works. Just trust in Christ. I said, his grace is free. You can have assurance of everlasting life just because you trust in Jesus. And you can see the smile on her face like it was like brand new news to her. So I was like, oh, and I'm just, I'm sitting there longing for like an hour and a half to spend with this lady so I can just really unpack it all for her and really tell her and these kind of things. But knowing that I just, you know, I just have a, you know, I just have some moments, you know, and I'm just trying to get the gospel to her to tell her. That the struggle is real because sin is real, because everlasting life is real, and we need good answers for the deepest struggle there is, and that's our own sinful hearts, our own sinful nature. This morning, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 have a clear answer for the struggle. And spoiler alert, is to put your hope in Christ, that Christ Jesus is the only hope in the midst of whatever struggle you have, Christ is the only hope. And, and the passage here is going to teach us, it, is, it has been teaching me this week, and it teaches us how it is we are to hope in Christ, not leaning on our own, our own stuff to do in Christ, but just like, this is who he is, so this is how you can respond to him. So let's look at the passage. Let's, I'm going to read it out loud, the whole thing, in one fell swoop, and then we'll go back and just sort of pick it apart. It says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, in the living, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you so cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from the Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands His steadfast love. And at night, His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then 
I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Isn't it beautiful, church? Isn't it a beautiful passage? And and this passage is not just beautiful in its form. It's beautiful in its content. It's beautiful in the fact that the Lord God gave us this passage so that when we face the struggle of our circumstances or the struggles of our sin, we have a real answer. Hope. Hope in Christ. That Christ himself is our hope. And he teaches us how to do this in this passage. Uh, the, the first way you begin to sort of work through the struggle, the struggle of your sin, your circumstance, others as we do it, is you sincerely question or cry out to God. You should should question God with sincerity of heart. What are the questions? If you were just to take this passage and just keep staring at it, you would notice there's lots of question marks in the text. There's lots of questions being asked to God of different sorts. Some of those questions are specifically to Him. Right? These are the sons of Korah who are writing this psalm. And what what are the questions they're asking? In verse 2, they're asking a question. When shall I come and appear before God? If you roll down to verse 9, they're asking God a specific question to Him, about Him. God, why have you forgotten me? Uh, Chapter 43, verse 2. Again, the sons of Korah are asking God a specific question. God, why have you rejected me? Me. These are questions he's asking God, that a follower of God is asking God, why have you forgotten me? Why have you rejected me? When can I come home? Now, how do I know they're sincere? How do I know that these aren't the questions of just a selfish or self-centered child that's just whining and complaining and saying, you need to fix this, God? Well, you look at the context around the questions. Right? Look at verses 1 and 2. Before he says, when should I appear before you? He says this, My soul pants like a deer pants for water. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. It's out of the longing that the psalmist is ready to leave this trouble behind, this longing to be in the presence of God, and this longing to know uh, this relationship with God, that this psalmist is ready to leave this trouble behind and be in the safety and refreshment of his God. That's a good longing to have. In question two, look at, look at verse eight before he asks it in verse nine. By day the Lord commands His steadfast love. At night His song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock. Does the psalmist believe that God has actually forgotten him? No. Does it feel like that in the moment? Apparently so. But he knows that God's wrong. He's praying to God. He knows of God's steadfast love. He knows of God's song on his life. He prays to God. And, he, and, and God is his rock. But what he prays in this hour, in this moment is, why have you forgotten me? I don't understand. There's a sincerity underneath the question. Not a selfishness, but a sincerity going, I know who you are, and my circumstances don't equate with what I know who you are, so help me know what's going on. Show yourself to me. The the third question is the same way. He says, vindicate me, defend me, deliver me. In the struggle, the psalmist, in the midst of of some of his worst times, apparently, he's still able to distinguish the truth about those who belong to God and those who do not belong to God, the children of God and the enemies of God. And he's saying, vindicate me, defend me, deliver me. 
And then he asks, why have you rejected me? Because this is how I feel because my enemies are around me all the time saying these things to me. If, if we're going to live in, in a world that is sinful, with a heart that's been regenerated, that's been saved by God, it's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, yet, yet we know we still live in the already. We still live in the sinfulness of what it is. We know what it is to be persecuted. We know what it is to be, to be sinful. We know what it is to, to have tragedy come our way from the outside. What does this mean for us? It means that we have to learn how to ask God the sincere question. We have to learn to ask Him the question of our souls in the context of the truth. We have to cry out to God. This means you have to come to faith in God. If you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you, don't, if you don't profess Him as the Savior of the world and the Savior of your soul, today is the day of salvation. You, you, he is this great God that you're going to keep seeing unpacked in this text this morning. It's not a God that I made up. It's not a God that we contrived together. It's the one true living God who came down and revealed Himself to us and by the power of the Holy Spirit has shown us and convinced us that He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. If you don't believe that, just keep looking at Jesus. And just keep just, just, just set him up against the other gods of the world and see if you don't find him more real, more loving, a, a more pursuing God as the rest of the gods of this world are asking you to do stuff to get to him. Christ came down. Put your faith in God. And if your faith is in God, then you need to come in faith to God. Because your circumstances can be so binding in your life that you grow unconvinced that He's actually there. That He's actually having His will and His way in your life. We begin to become convinced that actually God's not real, God's not true, He doesn't care, and therefore we begin to reject Him while we're asking Him while He's rejected us. But He hasn't rejected you. His arms are wide open to all those who call on His name. And, and so we have to learn to cry out, right, in faith to God. We... We, which means, very pragmatically, you need to take the time necessary to cry out to Him. And I feel like whenever I say those words, I have this, there's just this great, like, sigh from all the masses, like, time, right, right, let me find more time. Well, a couple things are true. Our lives can be really, really busy. But if He's the God of the universe, then it, you might consider the fact that it's very much worth it to order your time around His. To consider that the time you have is actually a gift from Him, and He's the Lord over it, and He's the one who gives it. So when we grow grumpy about how much time we don't have to spend with God, it's probably on me and on you, not on him. I always think of Susanna Wesley. She gave birth to 19 children. Nine of them she lost. She raised 10 of them. And history clearly tells us that the way she, I mean, how do you... How do you in the 1700s or 1800s, whenever it was, like how do you spend time with God with 10 kids, right? Because they're still waking up at 6 a.m., all of them. And they still won't go to bed when you ask them to. And there's no DVR to like, you know, there's no Netflix. Hey, just give me some space and time. Watch this real fast. And history tells us, history tells us that she sat in her kitchen. She threw her apron over her head. And all the kids knew do not jack with mom when the apron is over the head. She's in the presence of the Lord. And she would spend time with her Savior. 
we will be we will be more blessed by God. We will be more mature in Christ. We will know the presence of Christ when we start taking our time seriously as a gift and ordering it around who King Jesus is and stop challenging God to see if he can find some time in our busy schedules. And when we do that, we must cry out to God in this tension between God being our king and God being our father. There's a little bit of tension right there. Right? Because you don't go to God with a bunch of huff and puff and anger and be like, hey, God, where are you? Hey, God, why have you forgotten about me? Hey, God, why would you reject me in this terrible circumstance? You better give me some answers. Oh, no. No, no. Nobody approaches the king like that. Job does not approach the king like that. Jonah does not approach the king like that. Nobody. Esther never even once thought, according to the Scriptures, to approach a king in that fashion. And neither should you or me. We approach in humility. We approach Him humbly because of the truth of the nature of who He is. Whether we feel it or not, in the midst of our struggles, we approach Him with the truth even as the context of these cries reveal to us that the psalmist, the sons of Korah, knew the truth about who God truly was. He's the God that satisfies like the water in the heat. He's the God full of love, whose steadfast love comes out over and over again. He's this great and beautiful Savior. So we approach humbly. But the other side, right, another side of God is we also approach Him as a father. And with any good father, you can just run in with full hearts and just crash into his chest and say, help me. I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to be present. I need you to be available. I need you to hear my cry. And this great king does this very thing. He says, come into my courts, child. Plunge it right here. Feel my embrace. Know my safety. And tell me your concerns. Because I want to hear you. There's no God like that. There's not one other God who's like that. You can't find him. You can't find her. You can't find it. There's only one. King Jesus, who is the Heavenly Father. And we have to learn to approach Him. But you know what? You're only going to approach Him like this if you are, if you understand yourself to be, if you're convinced, if you believe that you are His child and, and you practice. You go to Him consistently enough where you realize that this is His consistent response. That this is the nature of who He is. In the midst of the struggle, we will have to cry out to Him sincerely, knowing who He is and who we are. Making that time and saying, Lord, answer my questions, please. And as you are doing this, the second thing that we should do in the midst of the struggle is we should lament. We should have true sorrow over the questions of our mockers. See what? Because the mockers are asking the psalmist questions as well. They're, they're, they're stated throughout the text, and but when you put them all together, you realize it's really just one question, right? In verse three, they just have one question. Look at it. Where is your God? We see you. We see you following Yahweh God. We see you talking about how He's the only one true God, and yet your circumstances look terrible from where we sit. Where's he at? Same thing in verse 10. Just a one, one proposition. Just, they just got one trick. Hey, where's your God now? Now that it's tough. Now that you struggle. Where's your God? Because we can't see him. Your life looks terrible. This, this sort of pseudo belief that if you have this good life, this good God, excuse me, you'll always have this good life. You always have this ease. You always have this, this no, no, no problems. 
That's not the God of the Bible. And, and in verse in, in, in verse two of chapter forty three, these same enemies are just they're just the enemies that are oppressed. There's no real question there, but once again, it brings the enemies up. And and what is the effect of the of the enemy upon the psalmist? Look at verse 3 of chapter 42. Look at it. What is it? Well, it's tears. Tears have been his food day and night. As they say to him all the day long, where is your God? Look at, look at verse 10. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversary taunts me. Verse 43 describes him mourning. Mourning what the enemy is telling us. And listen, we have enemies. You have at least one enemy in your life, and that's Satan himself and, and all his demons, and, and they would prefer you to, to, uh, to not follow Jesus Christ. Uh, their, their motto would be sort of like, misery loves company. We know we'll be miserable for all eternity. Why don't you join us? We have other enemies in our workplace, in our families, amongst our circle of friends. Why do our enemies ask us this question? Why do they come to us and say, oh, yeah, where's your God now? Well, part of the reason is, is because we sort of give them reason to do so. Because in our evangelism and in our witness, while things were going well for our lives, we sort of boasted about our God simply because of our good circumstances. We were trying to convince people of God's goodness because our life was easy. We were not properly praising God for those good gifts. We were not praising the giver. But we rather were boasting to others by comparison that our life was better than others, saying things like, well, if you don't believe in my God, just look at my life. It must be true. It, 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 must, it works for me. I haven't had anything else that worked for my life, but Jesus works for me. Brother and sister, Jesus don't work for you. Jesus saves you. He delivers you. And so when we come to times of trouble, our unbelieving friends are replying to us things like, hey, how's that working for you now? Hey, why in this tough time have you stopped going to church? Hey, why in this tough time do I not hear you espousing the same things you've been preaching to me for the last year and a half? Where's your God now? Listen, this is really, really important, church, that we move our joy from temporal circumstances to eternal realities. We have to, our joy has to be moved from that which brings us pleasure in the moment to a good hope that gives us pleasure forever. To, to the one who gives us pleasure forever. To the only source of salvation, Jesus Christ. The other reason our, our enemies ask us these questions is simply because they are unbelieving people. They will not receive the gift of faith that God is able to impart upon their hearts. The Bible calls them ignorant. The Bible says they refuse in the rebellion. The Bible says that the Lord gives them over to themselves because they just will not accept the realities of Jesus Christ. You can't stop that. You can't change that. The Holy Spirit can, but the Spirit blows where He wills. Our job is just to be obedient and to tell. Hey, there's a third reason these questions get answered. Sometimes, sometimes there's jealousy within the body. Sometimes in a congregation, and I'm not speaking out of this of, of current experience. I don't know this to be true in our body, but it could happen. Do you know the, the, the story of the sons of Korah, right? In, in, in chapter 42, at the very top, to the choir master, a mascal of the sons of Korah. Do you know the stories of Korah? Let me catch you up. Um. We actually read a passage today in our reading that isn't, it isn't a custom, right? We gave you a genealogy this morning, and I 
Just You can thank me later. I didn't ask you to read the names with me. That's fine. Amen. But we did it because those genealogies have meaning. They're important. They're still God's holy word, regardless of how boring we all claim them to be. But in that genealogy, it talks about the house of Korah. Roughly 450 years prior, if you go back today in your time, in your Sabbath rest, and you just read number 16, you'll read about them. But Korah was the dude who rebelled. Him and 250 people that he stirred up, they rebelled against Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And they said, why has God made you the leader? We're all holy. We're all priests. We have rights too. Why are you so important? Longer story, but it concludes with this. The next morning, the assembly gathered together and and the two sides met and the Lord opened up the earth and swallowed Korah and two other households and closed the earth up. Now, fast forward to these guys. Can you just imagine the insults? Right, because if you belong to Jesse James, you always belong to Jesse James, don't you? Yeah, that guy's dad was Jesse James. That's his great grandfather. Seven years later, be careful—he might be a thief. Hey, look at that guy. Hey, hey sons of Korah. Hey, careful! Like that dude's dad got swallowed up by the earth. Like you don't want to be around that guy. Like, jealousy, jealousy from Korah. Um, we. We don't need to have jealousy amongst ourselves about who came from where or who did what or who's doing what. We just need to follow the Lord who has better circumstances than the others or why do they seem to get all the blessings and I don't get all the blessings? That sort of ticks me off. Like You can go to God with that stuff, but you can't let it come on over and spill over in your relationship to others. We start telling people things because of our own jealousy. We start becoming enemies within the family. Can't happen. So what do we do? Well, church, we can't be surprised by the attacks of our enemies. We can't be surprised that Satan would come and, and bring circumstances in our lives or, or, or use others to, uh, who don't conform to the patterns of this world to insult us or discourage us or say, hey, where's your God now? 1 John chapter 3, uh, verse 13 says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. And we're done. That's just a truth from the Scriptures. It's great when the world doesn't hate us. But if you're going to live the truth out, you can be sure that somewhere you're going to face persecution. You're going to get people who ask you, hey, where's your God now? But when that takes place, you also should not be ashamed that what they do makes you sad. Rejection is difficult. Doubt comes when lots of voices tell you that your faith isn't real and true. To, to question God with sincerity, knowing that, that His truth overrides and supersedes the truth of those around you who would persecute you, but yet in our, in our weakness, we still have these doubts. We still have this anger that it's happening to us. We, we want to choose our own glory over God's glory. Let those things reveal to you your own weakness. And then take that weakness to the strong one who is Jesus Christ. Don't, don't give the world reasons to ask these questions. Don't simply boast when your life is good as if you expect it and it's supposed to be that way because that's God's requirement on your life. Rather, be grateful. Be grateful for the blessings of God as with unexpected and surprising grace and let that begin with your own salvation because that's a gift that's never going to change. That's a circumstance that's never going to get rocked. But the unexpected grace that you were bound for hell and that He saved you out of that and delivered you into heaven, like that's tremendous. Don't be jealous of each other. Rather, be jealous together in unity for the name of Christ. 
We ought to run to the king who is our father and lament and cry for him to defend and vindicate us and to bring us into safety. He has a plan for our lives in the midst of our difficulties and struggles. If you keep researching Korah in your Bible, what you realize after Numbers 16, you re- you'll read Numbers 26 through those genealogies, right? Numbers 26, and you realize that it tells us that, that some of the sons of Korah were actually spared. And then what you learn when you read the genealogies in 1 Chronicles, because I know that's where y'all first turn to, you're looking for a good encouraging word from the Lord. But when you get to 1 Chronicles 6, what you realize then is that Samuel, the prophet, comes from the line of Korah. And Samuel appoints Saul. And Saul messes it up. So the Lord says, go appoint David. And he does. And then David He appoints the sons of Korah to lead music, to lead the worship in the temple of God for the people of God. Disastrous circumstance in Numbers chapter 16. Beautiful King Jesus outcome in Chronicles. So go ahead, lament the questions of your enemies. Also, lament the questions to your own soul. What's the question you're asking yourself? Right? When you go through these services, what are you asking yourself? You're saying, why, Lord? Why? Why is it this way? But this is what the psalmist is asking. It's what Kor is asking. Why are you downcast, O my soul? It's not that the psalmist doesn't know why he's downcast. The whole psalm 42 and 43 gives us the reasons that he's downcast. It's rather that he, that he wants to know, he knows sort of the reasons for it, but, but in the midst of it, he doesn't understand why God would allow it. He doesn't feel close to God. Go back to your text. Go back to verse 4. And, and here he says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. What does he remember? Well, I would go out with a throng, with this great mass of people. Not only that, but he would lead those people in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs and of praise. The, the multitude keep a festival. He has this memory of days past. And he's like, oh, if it was just like that, why are you so downcast? Why can't it be like that? Uh, uh, jump down to, to verse 6. Because now he's entered the present day. My, my God, my soul, uh, sorry, my, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you right here, right now. I'm remembering you from the land of Jordan, of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Um, we don't know exactly where all this is, but we know that it's in the, the region of Jordan. We're not we're talking about like the north of Galilee and Jerusalem's down here. And he's looking from the, from maybe, from, maybe from a mountaintop. Uh, once author suggested that maybe he's actually in ca- maybe some sort of captivity and like as he's being carried away from his home, he's looking back. We don't know for sure. But the point is, I am far from the place I am supposed to be. But I'm remembering you right now. And, and s- verse 7 tells us the condition of his heart as he's away from his beloved city. Deep calls to deep at the roar of the waterfalls or the water spouts as the breakers crash over him time and time again, the, the, the waves. Chapter 43, verses 1 and 2, he's seeking vindication. He's de- seeking defense against the ungodly and deceitful and unjust people. And it's not until that happens that he's able to go into the future. Right? He goes into the future, to, to the altar of God. He says, I'm, I'm going to go there with, with joy. Right? With joy and praise and with the lyre, and I'm just going to worship you. So, so the reason when he says, why are you so downcast? Oh, my soul. He goes back to his past. He's in his present. He's looking toward the future. And the only thing his soul really wants is what verse 1 says he wants. As the deer pants for water, my soul longs for you. Here's why you're going through the struggle. Here's at least one reason you're going through the struggle. Here's one reason you're wrestling with sin. It's so the Lord will wake you up to let you know the only thing you really truly want is Him. Run to Him. Run to Him. So that when we've asked all the questions and made all the changes to our lives to fix everything, and our soul is still downcast, we can grow in faith, trusting Christ is all we need, and that He is our only hope. We tend to focus on what our trouble is. 
We can only see our adversaries. We can only feel the deep, and we can only know the distances between us and the Lord. And we forget to ask the question of what God is doing in the midst of all this trouble. Why are you so downcast, O my soul? I just want to be in your presence. Lord, when will this come to me? When will you grant me this time again to be in your presence in this way? Oh, Lord, you're my only hope. I'm going to have to depend upon you. Here's what Christ is doing in the passage. He's making sure that your only one singular perfect hope is him. That's what he's doing in the midst of your sin and your struggle. He's it. So then, the last thing that you have to do is you have to preach Christ's hope to your own soul. Now, this may not be an attractive idea to you because you're like, well, I come to listen to you preach every single Sunday. Why do I want more sermons daily from myself? Well, because in some level, the Holy Spirit's preaching to your life and your circumstance in a way that I never can. And in some ways, I can preach it to you in a way that you never can. So we'll do it together. But where's the hope in this passage? Where, where, where are we going to find it? Like, where, where is it? You just got to keep staring at the passage. But I'm, I'm going to help you for, for time's sake right now. Look at verse 8. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. It's a prayer to God. In chapter 43, verse 1, there's a prayer for, for protection to the God who is our vindication. And then in verse 3 of chapter 43, there's this prayer for, for light and truth. Right? Look at, look at it. Look at it right there in your Bibles. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Not my circumstance, not my enemies, not my own questions to my own soul, but your light and your truth, they need to lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and your dwelling, which is what he's been longing for from the past and in his present and looking forward to for the future. His light reveals the path we're to walk in, and His truth helps us remove the obstacles that position themselves in the path or exposes the paths of lesser lights. Jesus said He was the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus prays for His disciples in John 17 that the Lord would sanctify them in the truth because His word is the truth. Oh, you're going to take some time. You're going to have to take some time with the Lord and open this word and let him feed you by the power of the Spirit through this word so that you will ask him the right questions and he can speak to your heart. Where then, where then in the scriptures is this most displayed? Where is this hope that I am looking for? In the text, in the Bible, it's on the cross. Because even as the sons of Korah ask God these questions, there's a better son of Korah who is Jesus Christ himself. And when Jesus gets on the cross, he's got some statements to make, and it starts with a question. Jesus himself sincerely calls out to the king father, and he asks this question, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And let's be honest, church. Nobody's been more forsaken in all of humanity than Jesus Christ himself by his heavenly Father. Whatever you feel today about God's forsaking in your life, Christ understands it to the nth degree. He took your deepest sorrows and suffering on the cross. And just like the, the sons of Korah here, Jesus prays over his mockers. But it wasn't a call for vindication. Though tears were his food day and night in the Garden of Gethsemane, the wounds of words only filled in were the pain of the wounds of deadly blows to his bones weren't enough. Rather, he prayed not for the Father to vindicate him from his enemies. He prayed the Father would forgive his enemies because they don't know what they're doing. And Jesus himself lamented in his own soul. Think of his very last words. It is finished. And there's no question, there is a sense of triumph in these words as he has been obedient to the Lord and completed the task and has initiated salvation for all. But the word it carries Everything that led to that moment. His 
his whole life, his, especially his three years of ministry, the Pharisees persecuting him, trying to trick him, trying to trap him, the, uh, 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 the, the disciples not ever really getting it, questioning what he was doing, even to the point of rebuking Jesus in his ministry. Not to mention just the passion narrative itself where he's taking physical blows, where he's knowing the rejection of the Father. In his own soul, right, in those moments, wave after wave crashes over Jesus until he was reunited with his Father. Psalm 42. How will this hope make its way into our hearts? Sisters and brothers, we got to pray prayers for light and for truth. Ask the Lord to let His light and His truth, Christ Himself, to lead you. Let light and truth lead you to the holy hill of worship, into the very dwelling of God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. We, we need to be praying in the church. Uh, go to the altar of the Lord. Go to the God who is your exceeding joy. Pray, come, come here on Sunday mornings. Order your life around Sunday morning and say, I'm going to come and I'm going to praise God. I'm going to give him everything in my heart. Even when my struggles are real and they're difficult and they're deep, I'm going to pray. What if we as a body of Christ had the vulnerability to actually share the deeper things with each other after the service? We said, hey, I, like, this is what's really going on in my life. It's really difficult right now. And instead of us trying to fix that person, our first instinct was like, hey, let me just pray over you. Let me ask you a couple more questions so I understand what you're telling me better, and then let me just pray. And let's let this great God fix you need prayers of light and truth. You need prayers in the context of the church to bring this joy. Prayers, praying for each other instead of fixing each other. And then we need prayers for the future, to hope in God, to hope for future glory is not a wish that we might be saved, but it's in the assurance, the sure confidence that God's promise is to save is actually true. Hope is not whimsical. Hope is solid. It's a rock on which we stand. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, very first question says, what is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong to God. First Peter sums it up nice. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a what church? A living hope. Church, say it out loud. A living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh Lord, I can't wait to get back to the day where I led the throngs into your worship. Oh, oh Lord, you you have prepared for me a place so I can come back into the throngs ready to worship. You and the sons of Korah have something very, very beautiful and unique in common. You will get back into the presence of God fully. And you will worship His name in spirit and in truth. That is your hope. Cry out to God in the midst of the struggle.